Welcome on in Eagles fans to episode 49 of the No Huddle Show or Philadelphia Eagles podcast right here on NJ.com. I'm Joe Giglio, joined as always by Elliot Shore Parks, Mark Eckel. They cover the Eagles. Uh, they were there for the Eagles' first loss of the season, 24-23 in Detroit on Sunday afternoon. We're doing this podcast on a Tuesday, and for the first time all year, we have a loss to talk about, and, and there's a lot to unpack from this one, Elliot, as there's been a lot of conversation about the referees, the way the Eagles came out. Uh, what do you feel now? Almost, uh, almost two full days since the loss, the first loss of the year. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot of specifics to get into, as you mentioned, with the refs and the defense in the first half and the interception by Carson Wentz. But I'll say, I mean, even after the game, but definitely two days out, I, I don't think there's any reason to feel any worse about this team than there was before the loss. I mean, if you look at it, they had two bad quarters, really just two bad quarters on defense. But Carson Wentz, I mean, we, we've said even before – they, they traded Sam Bradford and definitely afterwards. This whole season is about Carson Wentz. I mean, it's a surprise that we th- that I think all three of us think they'll at least compete for a playoff spot. But at the end of this season, if they finish 7-9, and nine, you know, 6-10, and 8-8, eight and eight, something like that, but you're sure that Carson Wentz is legit, then that's a good season. And so in that way, even though they lost by a point on Sunday, I think Carson Wentz, you know, I, you, you say this every week, but I think he might have had his best game. I mean, that's on the road. Granted, you're not exactly in, you know, Lambeau Field, but, you know, I was, I was there in Detroit. It was loud. It was hostile. They fell behind early. The Lions had all the momentum, and Carson Wentz carried him back, and he almost had, you know, he almost had him back for the win if Ryan Matthews holds onto that ball. And then, of course, there's that interception, which we can talk about. But if you're an Eagles fan, I think there's no reason to feel any more pessimistic about this team and if anything maybe you feel a little better because once again Carson Wentz showed at least to me that he has all the qualities of a franchise quarterback yeah he brought them back to be down 14 nothing to be down 21 10 at the half and then take the lead in the second half that was impressive unfortunately like Elliot mentioned there Mark the fumble happened by Ryan Matthews the Eagles do not um, you know get the ball and be able to move it down the field again because of the interception what did you think about the overall game market and really why the Eagles lost? If you had to pinpoint a reason, and there's been a lot of talk about the referees, what, what would it be for you? Nothing, it had nothing to do with the referees. The Eagles lost, and I'm, and I'm never, ever a, a, a kind of guy that blames one thing. I'm the kind, I defended Bill Buckner for his error against the Mets in the World Series because I said if Stanley didn't throw a wild pitch a couple, you know. But, but there's one, Ryan Matthews lost the game. It's plain and simple. Forget the penalties. Forget the please. Forget the referees. They, you know they they overcame the penalties. They overcame a terrible defense in the first half. They overcame all that. They had the lead and the ball near midfield. Matthews holds onto the ball, even if he doesn't get the first down. The Eagles have one of the best punters in football, and Donnie Jones. He punts them down to the fifteen at least, maybe the ten. I don't think the I don't think the Lions are going to go down the field and kick them. They, if they did then I would blame the defense for letting the Lions do that. But, no, I'm blaming it all on Ryan Matthews, so plain and simple. Let me ask you, Mark, before we go back to Elliot and, and, and talk about the, the fumble and, and what it meant and everything after that, did either of you think, and we'll start with Mark on this one, that the Eagles, the play call there, I mean, Matthews can't fumble the ball, but he, did, Peterson trusted Wentz to throw on, the I think, the downs before. Third and seven, he let him throw the ball. Uh, third and two, I always think it's a, a kind of weird down to try to run on because it's a short little space. Did you think give any thought to maybe letting Wentz throw the ball there on that third down? Yeah, yeah you could have gone either way. I, I didn't hate the call. I hated the, the the play. I hated Ryan Matthews fumbling. I mean, third and two used to be a running down. I mean, over the years, it's it's developed into a passing down. But no, I didn't mind that. I, I mean, I didn't like Ryan, to be honest. I don't know why Ryan Matthews was the was the bulk of the running game Sunday. Where was when Wendell the Eagles have played one good team this year, okay? The Pittsburgh Steelers. Wendell Smallwood in his only in his rookie debut basically, because he had what one carry the first gains seventy nine yards against a good Pittsburgh Steelers team. And we don't see him. He's invisible Sunday. He Elliott had as many carries as Wendell Smallwood did. Here's a little small one. Why is Ryan Matthews, who's, let's be honest, Ryan Matthews isn't that good, right? I mean, come on. I don't care what Peterson tells me how good he was running. He averages three yards a carry. That's what he is. Here's what I would say, though. And I agree overall with uh, with Mark on that about, you know, getting Kenya, both Kenyon Barner and Wendell Small with the ball more. Yeah, Barner but too. I think, if, if we're, yeah, if, if, if we're talking about just that situation, Joe, just the, though, just that play, 
I think, A, giving the ball to Matthews was the right call there. I mean, he's the veteran. Um, you know, Kenyon Barner had that fumble last year in that spot. Wendell Smallwood's a rookie. Maybe you can make the argument for Sproles, but, I mean, I think that's, you know, I, I'm not going to say if, if Sproles well, no, has the ball, they don't fumble. Hey, yeah, Matt, you can't put Smallwood in for his first carry there. I mean, no, but right. I, I just don't like – I didn't like I didn't like a lot of things. This was the worst coached game the Eagles have had this this year by far. Well, wow. yeah, and before you get onto that, let me just I just wanted to add really quick and to add to your point, I guess. I didn't like the play call in the way that if you're gonna run it, why not just run it up the middle? I mean, that's Ryan Matthews' strength. You know, he is a, a thicker guy. He's he's better at going between the tackles than anybody else on the team. And also, if you run to the side, you know, the whole purpose of you of running the ball there is really to continue to kill the clock. If you run to the side, who knows? I mean, maybe he gets pushed out of bounds, something like that. But not only that, I think if he runs the ball up the middle, there's a better chance he's protecting it a little better. He's probably holding it with both hands, that, that, that type of thing. But, you know, you take him out to the side on the sweep play, um, and the Lions said it. They said they noticed that when Ryan Matthews was, was in open space, he carried the ball loosely, and, you know, they went after it. So I didn't like the play call in that regard. Had they thrown it with Wentz, I would have been okay with it. I think Wentz is at the point where, which sounds, I guess, kind of crazy to say, but where you can trust him with almost any, with, with almost anything. I mean, I don't think, you know, he made the bad decision on, on the interception play later on. But I think in that instance, had they thrown it, I wouldn't have killed him, but I do think running the ball was the right call. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. Matthews fumbles the ball, and the Eagles um, give up the field goal after that. But they did get the ball back. So let's unpack the end of this game, and then we'll go back to some well, of the I think bigger we're points. skipping one very important play that no one is really talking about. Go ahead. And I think it's as just it's not as important as a fumble, but just as important as the interception. All right, the Lions, the Lions didn't get the ball back at the ten yard line. They got it back at the forty something. They weren't in field goal range when they got the ball back. Right. It was third and four. And Elliot, you and I talked about this right before the play. I said to you, what do you do if this pass goes incomplete? What do you do on fourth and four? And we were debating whether you, you try a very, very long field goal or do you go for it on fourth and four? Well, it never got to that because on third and four, Golden Tate split the safeties and made a big play. Where you know That was a bad – as well as the defense played the second half, they reverted back to their first half form, letting Golden Tate gain 20-something yards on a, on a third and four. That set up the winning field goal. It did, and, and really the crazy part about that, and Mark, you mentioned the first half form, which we could talk more about in a little bit, but I think the Eagles gave up only 45 yards of offense the entire second half, and most of it was on that play. I mean, they picked yeah. the wrong time to actually give up a play of any yard. Yep. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln. That's right, it was. The, the end did not work out well for the Eagles. So they give up the field goal there, and they get the ball back. And Elliot, what did you think of the way the interception happened. Now, look, Wentz was going to make a mistake at some point. The ball was going to land in someone else's hands. We know that. Um, but people have talked about the decision to go down the field, take a chance, give his guy a chance to make a play rather than trying to you know, meticulously move the ball down the field. Did you have a problem with Wentz taking a shot deep, or did you kind of like the aggressiveness of let's try to make a play here? Mm -hmm. When he first made the throw, my initial reaction was, that's unacceptable. I mean, I understand it's only his fourth game, but Wentz has played at a high enough level where I th think we can hold to a high standard in that situation. Um, you know, if, if he would have, you know, dink and dunked it down on the field, I mean, you know, maybe the play extends. I guess you can make the argument that if he throws it deep, you know, maybe you get a pass interference call. I guess Aguilar was open for a split second, um, and, he, and, and Wentz is probably right. It was not a good throw. Um, by him but I think the decision in that instance I mean this is this is the good and the bad of Carson Wentz this is the gunslinger mentality that the Eagles liked about him I mean you know it's a throw you could picture Brett Favre making it's kind of like uh remember when the Packers lost to the Eagles uh, a few years like it was all the way back in the day and Brett Favre threw it up and Dawkins intercepts it I think it was close to overtime I mean these are the type of throws that Favre would make and it's the type of throws that people that take chances with the ball it's probably a throw Sam Bradford doesn't make so do I like the fact that he was confident enough to, to make the throw and to attempt it? Two days out, I guess that is something you like. But at, in the moment, I think, you know, he has to be smarter. It's, it's the first play. You know, you have plenty of time on the clock. You only have, what, do you, what were they at, like the 25? So you have to go 50-something yards to get a field goal attempt. I mean, I just think in that instance, uh, I, I did not like the throw. But since the game, I've come around a little bit to the to fact of people that are saying, yeah, I, I do like the fact he was willing to attempt it, I guess. I liked it. I liked it. I had no problem with it. I mean, yeah, you could dink and dunk. You had 128 with no timeout. So you better dink and dunk out of bounds, number one. Number two, it was. For, I love that it was because it was first down. All right, 
now again, I didn't like the result of, the, of an interception, but if it falls, even if it falls incomplete, it's you, you didn't take much time off the clock, and you still got second, third, and fourth down to work the ball to get another first down and keep moving. Maybe first down, not a problem. I mean, the execution. It, it, Wentz admitted it wasn't a, a his best throw today. Aguilar's got to make a better. Aguilar was terrible ball. on that play. Oh, that's it was awful. Was he just yeah. didn't fight for the ball at all. I mean, the thing once once you're not going to catch it, now you got to turn into the cornerback and play defense and not let Slay catch it. And Aguilar said after the game, he said he had trouble tracking it. Um, you know, he didn't see it until late. And then uh, on Monday, on, in this day after press conference, Peterson said basically what you two just said, that the mentality has to be if it's not your ball, it's nobody's ball. I mean, Aguilar, you know, everyone talks about how uh, and this is good to the officiating. I, I don't think Aguilar was interfered with the more I watched that play. I mean, there was a picture going around um, on Twitter and I'm sure other forms of social media where it looks like uh, Slay is holding the uh, arm of Nelson Aguilar. But when you watch the actual video, he barely grazes the arm yeah, of was... Aguilar as they're running. I mean, in that instance, that, the, you know, I do not think that there should have been a pass interference call there. No. Ag- Aguilar, if anything, looks out of control because he's got no idea what he's doing as he's tracking the ball. That's and he was not problem. held. Yeah. My problem with the play, I like I said, I love being aggressive. I will never, if you're, as I wrote um, Monday, if Carson Wentz's weakness is his is him being too aggressive, well, that's a good weakness to me. I mean, yeah. Um, I'd rather like you like Ellie. You, you said Sam, that's a play Sam Bradford probably wouldn't have thrown, and that's what we used to criticize Sam Bradford for not always being taking the safe route, always trying to dink and dunk your way downfield. Thinking and dunking it is nice, but not when there's a minute 28 and no timeouts. I mean, it, I'm not it, saying you dink and dunk. I, I'm it not saying you dink work. and dunk, it's, but it's, you got to be perfect. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I just don't think Aguilar was open enough where it's you, uh, you definitely take the throw. And people have also said, um, and I disagree with this, that Peterson shouldn't have even called a play that had that as an option. And, you know, oh, that was not that's, that's, that's was not the first football. option. I mean, you have to send the guy deep to open up. I mean, right. if if Matthews was open, it's because Aguilar went went deep, and you took Slay out of out of out of the play. I mean, no, I have, right. I have no problem with the with the play call. I have no problem. I have no problem with any of it except I would. I might have sent somebody else deep instead of Aguilar. <laughs> and I mean that 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 well, that's uh, well, two things. Uh, two things. First, I I would have almost preferred to see DGB down there. I know he might not be as quick as Aguilar, but he has a way mm-hmm. bigger catch radius. He's a more physical player, and I think He's just as fast. you know, I think yeah, no, he is pretty fast. Um, but I think through now, Aguilar has played probably sixteen games, something like that. I know he missed a few last year. He's just not a good player when it comes to judging the ball in the air. I mean, even when with passes that aren't as deep as that one. I mean, the touchdown he had against the Browns, you know, Wentz just put that in his hands as he was running. I mean, that was an amazing throw. But there's been a few times this season where Wentz has gone down the field to Aguilar, and he's just done a poor job judging the ball in the air and that's what you saw that uh, on that play so I think it might be time to start sending DGB deep on those on those routes and I don't know what you do with Aguilar um in a larger pitcher uh not just you know obviously with that game but I mean do you continue to play him as much I, I do think he's looked at in some aspects as an improved player but the numbers just aren't there I mean he had another drop against the Lions on Sunday I think it was on third down um and then obviously you know he misplays the the what ended up being in some ways the biggest play of the game but Besides, I guess, obviously the Matthews fumble. But the Eagles have to figure out what they're going to do with Aguilar because he didn't have a good training camp. He, he had that good game against the Browns, but that's that's faded away now. Um, and they have issues at receiver. So it'll be interesting to see if, you know, going into this Redskins game, if maybe DGB takes a little more of those uh, carries. I mean, not that carries, of like his reps. He loves, Aguilar's playing great. Well, yeah, but he's going to say that. Oh, okay. So the Eagles dropped the game on Sunday to the Lions 24-23. The end of the game, obviously, there's a lot to talk about, and we did with the Matthews fumble and the Carson Wentz interception and some of the play calling and how that all went down. But just as we're doing this podcast on a Tuesday morning, uh, the news just broke. Lane Johnson's 10-game suspension has been upheld. So we can start looking forward here. The Lions loss leaves a bitter taste, I think, in Eagles fans' mouths. But now, Washington on Sunday, we'll get into the game, but more than that, the Eagles have to try to figure out how they're going to configure this offensive line and survive here without Lane Johnson. Elliot, I don't think it's a surprise that he's suspended for 10 games and it was upheld, but now reality, I think, sets in for the Eagles and, and how they're going to get through this. Losing Johnson for 10 games is obviously a big deal, and when this happened back in the summer, we all talked about it and said it was a big loss. He's their best offensive lineman, but it was the difference between this team winning four or five games. This wasn't a team we thought that was going to compete for the playoffs. 
now that they're, you know, three and one, arguably the best team in the NFC East and at least competing for the division, this loss is even bigger. I mean, the year Chip won the division in 2013, his first year as a head coach, you know, it kind of surprised everyone, which was a little bit of what was kind of going on with this team. Chip had all five offensive linemen play every snap that year. And it's not really something people talk about a lot when they discuss why he had so much success early on. And that was definitely helping Doug and Carson Wentz. Now you have to reshuffle the offensive line potentially. You're going to maybe get, you'll get him back the last two games. But then the question is, do you put him back in? If the offensive line's playing well and you're still competing for a division, do you put him back in? So it raises a ton of questions immediately for this season. But also in the big picture, let's not forget now, he's got two suspensions on his record. If he gets suspended, if he tests positive for PEDs again, that's a two year suspension, which is essentially his career. So. You know, Johnson was signed as somebody to, to a huge deal this past offseason to be a cornerstone of this franchise, to eventually replace Jason Peters at left tackle. And, you know, one of the, one of the more dependable players in the organization. Now, he's, he's a huge question mark, both how he plays when he gets back and, you know, how much you can really depend on him going forward. Yeah, he can't be trusted, obviously, moving forward. And I, I saw the statement from Howie Roseman. Clearly, they're disappointed. They should be. He's their best offensive lineman or right up there as their best offensive lineman this year. And, uh, Mark, big picture, this is a problem, clearly, because of what Elliot just said. But, you know, short term, it also creates uh, a, an interesting question of what they're going to do. There's, I mean, this is all happening as we talk, but, and I'm sure the Eagles will talk to you guys soon about what the plan might be. But how do you think the Eagles replace Lane Johnson? Do you think it's two moves, or is it one move in terms of moving right. Barber to left to right tackle or, or keeping him at left guard. How do you think they, they fix this problem now? Well, that's that's the question, Joe. That, that's Doug Peterson. He has two options, and he's I don't think he knows exactly what he's going to do yet. I think they're going to practice, you know, Wednesday and Thursday both ways and see what looks better. Uh, the one option is to move Alan Barber from left guard to right tackle and then insert either uh, Stefan Wisniewski or – Isaac Samalo in, in, in at left guard. My guess would be Wisniewski at this point, only because he's a veteran. He's been around and he's been there a little longer. He's been dressed at least. Um, but and then the other option is just to leave Barber alone and just put in uh, Vitai, the the rookie, um, at right tackle. I prefer that one. I I don't. I mean, you're you're going to be worse at right tackle no matter what you do. Do you have to be worse at left guard too? I mean, I would just. I would take my chances and put some, you know, put it, just keep Barber at left guard. I mean, keep this in mind too. I mean, Barber has played one game at right tackle this decade and he broke his ankle doing it. So I'm not saying he's going to break his ankle again, but my point is he's only played one game since 2010 at right tackle. He's been a guard uh, since he came into the league. I mean, since when he came into the league, he played some right tackle. Then he got, and he wasn't very good at it. He got moved to guard and he's kind of survived as a guard. Now you want to move him back to right tackle where he isn't as good and then put somebody in at left guard who isn't as good as he is. Uh, and now you're hurt. Now you're weakening yourself, you know, at at two spots on your line. 40% of your line is now different and not as good. Um, the other option is, you know, what if Vitae isn't any good? We haven't seen him play since the preseason when he was playing against, playing with and against backup. So Peterson said last week, that you know, two weeks ago, whenever it was, that when asked about, why Vitae all of a sudden what made what moved him up and he he praised him for his work in practice going against uh the Eagles first team line which is some pretty good players there if, if he's going against you know Vinnie Curry and Brandon Graham every day and doing a good job against them then maybe he's a pretty good player we don't we have nothing we have nothing to base Vitae off so we don't know yeah this is obviously a big decision now and, and the Eagles have to figure this out on the fly before a division game against the Redskins and then the Vikings after that which doesn't leave much time for whoever comes in and, and fills in here to to get acclimated before probably the best defense in the NFL or at least the NFC. So Mark w- when you look at the Eagles now how much of a difference does a right tackle make? He's a very good right tackle but you know we we kind of look at these things like oh if a team loses this star player or that star player it'll cost them this much. Does your opinion of what the Eagles can be this year change, or, or yes. had you already factored in Lane was going to be missing, or do you kind of do it right now? Well, I did both. I mean, I didn't think they were going to be very good, and one of the reasons was the loss of Lane. I mean, we knew it was going to come eventually. You know what? Let me say this, though. There was all of a sudden, I guess because it took so long, and every as every week went by, there was getting to be some, maybe obviously false hope, but there was some hope that, hey, maybe he'll win his appeal. Hey, maybe he won't get 10 games. Um, so there was a lot of, you know, 
optimism that would maybe again maybe it was just hope, but now now it's a fact. He's he's ten games. He's not back till the next to last game of the season against the Giants. And my thing with that is, can he you know can a guy sit around for, and not and and keep in mind for people that that aren't aware of this. He, when you're suspended, you're suspended. You're not allowed in the building. He's not allowed in the Novacare complex for the next 10, 10 weeks. He can't go to. He can't be at practice. He can't go to meetings. He has, he can have no contact with Doug Peterson or Jeff Stoutland or any of the Eagles coaches. If he's found, you know, I don't know what the what the ramification is, but it's serious. Like he you, he's done. He can't be around. So can a guy not be not play or not be practice, not do anything for ten weeks? And then come back and play that eleventh week. I don't. I don't know. I don't know either. And I feel like the timing of this mark does, in a way, it's helped, right? Because you had Lane to get off to the three and one start, and he I'd have rather had him the first ten games. Yeah, because now you think about it, and and just because this dragged on so much, the earliest he can come back is week sixteen, which is a short week against the Giants. They happen to play I a Thursday to night too. Yeah. Yeah, so they'll, he'll only be back for the last two games of the year. So they're going to have to you – know, the season's going to be made or broken without him. Right, so that, that's a point, too. If they're – they, they would have played 14 games. So if they're 6-8 and eight at that point or whatever, if they're out of the race at that point, don't even play him, right? What's the difference? Yeah, I mean, it's it certainly changes the decision. But if they're, let's say, 8-6 and six or 7-7, seven and seven, and if if they have a chance with those last two games against the Giants and Cowboys to somehow win this division, which... Then, you, then yeah. Yeah, then that, that changes it. Oh, yeah, it, it's a big... I, I'll argue that other than Carson Wentz, Lane Johnson is the most important person on that offense. And that makes this a big blow, because this isn't just some player here. This is the best offensive lineman they have. And, Mark, right. I think we, we talked about this a few weeks ago. It's not just this. It's now if you have another injury, then all of a sudden exactly. your depth is gone. Right. They can now. And, and, and guys, you know, it's been very, very fortunate. They, but they lost Ertz for two games. But that's a position where they have depth. I mean, Brent Selleck is still, you know, he's not what he was, but he's still, you know, he can get you through a couple games and play pretty well, as he did. Trey Burton's a very good third tight end. So losing Ertz for two games was certainly not the end of the world, and they, they won both games. Um, they lost McKelvin, and you could argue that, Jalen Mills is just as good as McKelvin. I think, I mean, from what I've seen, I haven't seen a noticeable difference in the two of them. But to lose Lane, you know, for Johnson to come out, Vitae comes in and looks, you know, and stranger things have happened, I guess. If he comes out and wows everybody, then maybe it's not a big loss. But just on paper, going from Lane Johnson to a, a rookie fifth-round pick who's never played before is quite a drop-off. And like you said, God forbid if 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 one of the guards gets hurt or Jason Peters goes down, now you're really in trouble on the offensive line, and, and the offensive line that you know that, that affects Carson Wentz. It affects it affects the running game. It's going to affect. It could affect if, if Vitae is starting at right tackle, they may have to keep a tight end in to help a lot. So that affects you know Ertz and Selleck and 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 Wentz because it's one less you know option for 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 him in 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 the passing game. So yeah, a, a loss of a guy like Lane Johnson is a bad. Is to me is a big big loss. Mark, how do you think the, the guys in that locker room, obviously Howie Rosen put out a statement just a few minutes ago as we record this, and, and he used the word disappointed in there, which any team would be, but how do you think other players react to this type of thing? Because although Lane will argue he didn't know, it was an accident, all that kind of stuff, and he tried to win this appeal, I mean, his actions now cost the team. Do you think other players get upset about this kind of thing, or do they understand it from a player's perspective that you know maybe it will happen to them one day by accident type of thing? I think each individual treats it differently. There will be some guys that will be like, yeah, Lane let us down. This is, you know, what the hell? I mean, you know, we're, we got something good going here and he, he really messed us up. And then the other guys will take the other approach. I remember going way, way, way back again when, and this guy wasn't, it wasn't quite the same because he wasn't just traded for him. But one of the first um, suspensions for steroids was Ron Soult. I don't know if you guys re- remember him. The Eagles traded for him. He was a pro bowl guard with the Colts, uh, the Eagles needed help on the line. They, they trade for, for Ron Salt and Salt, I think plays one game and then gets, gets, um, a suspension and the players on the team. Then that was the Jerome Brown, Seth Joyner, um, you know, that, that era, Reggie White, Clyde Simmons, they were up in arms. They were like, Oh my God, we trade for this guy. And he gets, what's this, you know, they, they were, they, and they voiced it. They were not, they were not pleased that the Eagles traded for a guy that was about to, that got suspended. Right, and this is a little bit different because he's a guy that's been here. The Eagles re-sign him in the offseason, which I think that adds to the disappointment. I mean, they invested in this guy to be part of 
not just this year's team, but sure. the future. And, um, and so that adds to And like Elliot said a few minutes ago, and Elliot just had to drop off uh, to go, you know, do some reporting and make some phone calls on this situation. So we'll catch up with him next week. But, you know, Mark Elliott said it a few minutes ago before he had a run that, you know, the Eagles now are staring at the fact that Lane is one more suspension, one more positive yeah. test away from a two year suspension. Yeah, and, that, and like oh, you said, that that's his career basically. You don't miss. I don't know of any player. Oh, Mike Vick, I guess, but um, that could miss two years and and come back and and pick up where you where you left off. Um, I know just from being around you know, from when it first broke back in August that it was going to happen. You know, I've heard. You know, I'm we're down here every day, and you know, you, I've heard things from people that they're yeah, the team is not not happy at all with this, and 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 they shouldn't be. And there was, and the team was, there was no benefit of the doubt coming from the people and some of the people in the organization either that, you know, that it was a mistake or, um, you know, he, he, you know, it was, they didn't, they didn't believe his appeal. I don't think, I don't think the team had really thought there was a chance that he was going to win that appeal, even though I think he did. I think him and his lawyers and his agents and stuff, um, thought he had a good case and, that's where that's where as I mentioned earlier that the hope and and the optimism was 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 coming in that this might not be a ten game that they could maybe that it that it he could could win it and get nothing but um the hard facts are that it his appeal wasn't good enough and he's getting ten games which it's a long time it is and it's a long big juncture of this season here all right let's look forward a little bit we'll talk about the Redskins game but even beyond that Mark we'll come back to the Redskins game and just for this week. But I think the schedule looks different now than it did maybe when this season started. I mean, you look at it now, and the Giants might have some big issues, so maybe they're the exception to this. But you can make a case, just looking forward, they're not going to see a team with a losing record at the time they see them for a long time now. I mean, they have the Redskins who are 3-2 and two this week, Vikings undefeated, Cowboys yeah. on Sunday night, uh, the Giants who will have the Ravens and Rams. Maybe they'll get you know better on those two teams before they see them. And then the Falcons, who... I didn't chalk up as a very difficult game before the season, but that looks different now. And then that leads into the difficult stretch, we thought, with Seattle, Green Bay, Cincinnati. What do you think about this schedule as the NFL season has kind of changed things around? Well, that was, you know, when everybody was killing me early in the year when I said I didn't think this team was going to win a lot of games, it wasn't because I thought that – I mean, it was partially because I, I didn't think the team was very good, but it was also because of the schedule. I kept saying this is a daunting schedule. This is, you know – I thought, I'll be honest, I thought the Bears were going to be better than they were. I really did. I thought John, John Fox's track record is in his second year, he does much better and blah, 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 but it, it hasn't worked out as well. But yeah, I, you know, I thought Atlanta, I didn't think Atlanta was going to be as good as they are looking right now, but I thought they'd be a, you know, a wild card con, con, contender, a, you know, a, a nine and nine win team, maybe nine, maybe even, maybe 10 pushing it. Um, you know, like you said, Green Bay, Minnesota, they were my, I think they're the, Going into the year, I thought that was my NFC Championship game. Um, Seattle at Seattle, that's always that's that's always tough. Cincinnati at Cincinnati, very tough. That was the other thing too. Not only is the schedule, not only did I think the schedule was very tough, but where they have to go, going to Seattle, going to Cincinnati, even going to Baltimore. I, I mean, if Baltimore was here, I'd say All right, they could beat Baltimore here. Baltimore there is a lot tougher. Baltimore's a pretty good home team through the years. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know there, like you said, there isn't the easiest game was the lions game that they just played last week and lost. It was. And that was a game that, you know, as we talked about the start this show that they had every opportunity to win and they, they could have won and they probably should have won. All right, let's end with this Mark division game on Sunday in Washington, a team the Eagles have really struggled with lately. I mean, the, the Redskins have beaten them, I believe three straight times. I think the last time the Eagles beat the Redskins was that game a couple of years ago where Nick Foles took that yeah. big hit. And he got back up and actually, you know, played really well that day. And they beat the Redskins in Philadelphia. So it's been basically two years, two calendar years since they beat them. This is a big one, not only because it's the first division game, but the Vikings, who are undefeated with Sam Bradford, which is amazing, uh, they loom on the other side. So I think this game, I'm not going to say must win at 3-1, and one, but you, if you think the Eagles can make the playoffs or you want them to or you feel like they have a real chance, it's hard to make a case if they lose this game because all of a sudden things could get really difficult really quick. Absolutely, Joe. Couldn't agree more. This is, yeah, it's it's too early in the season to call anything a must win, but it's a a perception game. I'll call it that. If they win the game, 
and I don't care how they win it, but if they win the game, they're four and one. Four and one is four and one, and they'll be they'll be one of the best teams in the league at four and one. And that'll be a great game against the five and zero Vikings coming in, right? Because Vikings have a bye this week, so they don't right. play. So it'll be a five and zero against a four and one. It'll be you know it'll be the game of the week, um, and everybody will be hyped for it. And well, they should be. And who knows if if they're, if, they're, if you're four and one, you you're pretty confident about yourself. It'll be a good bounce back after a bad loss to the Lions. Um, now on the flip side, they lose the Redskins, and again, I don't care how they lose. I don't last play get blown whatever. If but if they lose. They're three and two, two straight losses. Maybe that start to the season was kind of a mirage. Maybe that Steeler game. Cause let's be honest, the Browns and Bears still. They all right. The Eagles are better than the Browns and Bears. Big deal. What's that get you? Um, so maybe people start questioning that Steeler game a little bit. That's the one that opened everybody's eyes. So now you lose. You know, because I don't. I'll be honest. I don't think the Redskins are that good. I think they're okay. Right? Do you agree with me on that? Yeah. I think the last three weeks, they've obviously saved their season. But, I mean, think about all three of those games. They beat the Giants, a close they game late. Came back, yeah. the, the Browns actually were, you know, in that game against oh. them in Washington. And then yeah. last week, you know, the Ravens, who just had to fire their offensive coordinator, and Marty Morningweg is actually now there in Baltimore as the coordinator. You know, if they had any pulse offensively, the Redskins probably don't win that. I'm with you. I think the Redskins, they're not bad, but they're not, yeah, they're they're not just very okay. good. They're just, just okay. okay. Yeah, I don't. I'm not a big. I didn't think the Redskins. I didn't think they were that good. Like, well, they won the division last year. That that they didn't beat a team with a winning record all all year. Right. So, right. Yeah, I'm not a. I don't. I think they're just. I think they're maybe an eight and eight team. I. I don't. So a loss there wouldn't. I would start rethinking my. That maybe I was right all along about the Eagles. Yeah, and it's going to be one that we're going to – it's going to be a really first division game of the year, a great test for the Eagles, back-to-back road games. Can they rebound from last week? We'll be back next week after the episode, all three. Mark, myself, and Elliot back next week after the game. And we'll look forward, Mark, to uh, – if, even if it's a loss, it'll be a big story with Sam Bradford coming back with the undefeated Vikings. But like you Can't just said – I can't wait to see Sammy again. That's right. If the Eagles do win and they beat Washington, it'll be 4-1 and one Philadelphia, 5-0 and oh, uh, Minnesota. We'll talk about it next week. and. Uh, We'll see how the Eagles respond without Lane Johnson. Mark, as always, appreciate the time. Thank you, Joe. And thank all of you for listening to episode 49 of the No Huddle Show, our Philadelphia Eagles podcast right here on NJ.com. You can listen on Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud. Leave us a rating on iTunes. It helps the show grow so we can bring more to you in the future. Everyone have a great week. We'll be back next week to talk on the No Huddle Show.